The Global Troop Resource, trying to put a thousand skills into every troop's backpack. Welcome to part two of the Photography Merit Badge. In this lesson, we learn about stop action and shutter speed, film speed, surmounting problems with flash, and the exposure triangle. We also begin our next topic on the art of photography, where we discuss natural light versus artificial light, fill light, and the science of red eye. I'm Coach Scott. Let's jump right in. Here is shutter speed and stop action, right? So here, if you've got a shutter speed of 1 16th of a second, this is a fan, all right? And the fan is spinning around in circles. And notice you can't see the blades at all. Why? Because the shutter stays open long enough that it gets this, it catches the whole movement of the fan, right? And now, if you take that same camera and take a picture of the fan at 1 25th of a second, it only opens for less time to take a picture. So the fan blades can't go as far around in the circle as they can at 1 16th of a second. And then if I take it at 1 125th of a second, the fan blades don't have enough time to move very much at all, so they come in clearer. So when you're taking sports photos with my camera and I'm taking pictures of football and I want to catch a picture of the football just as the quarterback's throwing it, just as it's leaving his hand with everything in beautiful focus, would I prefer to have my camera set at 1 16th of a second or 1 500th of a second? Uh, one five hundred. Yes, absolutely. Good answer. All right. All right. So, puzzle me this: which shot used a higher shutter speed, and how do you know? Those are old pictures. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Since you knew that, tell me, or Aaron, you tell me, which uses a higher shutter speed, and how do you know? Uh. The one on the right? Like the one on the right, that's correct. Or the one sort of down to the bottom. How do you know? Because it's less blurry. That is correct. And there's another factor as well. It's darker? Yes, exactly. Okay. So what she's saying is you can see this scout right here moved when the picture was being taken. And it's blurry. So that means we had a shutter speed that was open for a long time so that he actually moved and that movement was caught on the film. The other thing that she's noticed is look how bright and, and filled with light this picture is. Why? Because the shutter was open for a long time. So the film could accept a lot of light. This one down here, fast shutter speed, people are moving but they are frozen in space and it's a little bit darker so that you can see that not as much light came through. Good answer, Aaron, fantastic. All right, so who can answer me this one? Why is this blurry and how do you prevent it? How about Robert? Um, you get a, a camera that going, that's, in, that's, well, that goes by like a second faster, well, like make it go by like 1,000th of a second. Very good, okay. And there's another factor as well, which someone else mentioned at the very beginning of this. You'll see that these cars, if, it was, if this was taken on a tripod, the cars would be arcing in a beautiful, even circle, right? But you got all these wavy lines here. What do you think is causing those wavy lines? From the camera being a little too big, like the lenses being a bit bigger. Hmm, not the lens being bigger, but it has to do with how stable the camera is. So we've got the, the cameras, the shutter speed is, is very slow. That's why the cars are all blurry as they're moving around the track. And also because it's slow and it's being handheld, it's not a beautiful curve. They sort of got these wavy lines because the camera's been moved like this while the picture was being taken but not enough to make it like a stripe across, but just enough to wiggle. So maybe 
they were trying to hold it as still as they could, and everybody else was jumping up and down in the stands, and they were like, oh, make sense? All right, who's going to puzzle me this? And I'll let a volunteer try this. Do you think you'll use a faster shutter speed inside with electric light or outside on a bright day, and why? Who's got a guess? Owen, how about you? You would want to use a faster shutter outside, well... Because electric lights aren't as bright as out outside like lights, so outside it would like make it less like washed out, I guess. Yes, that's correct. Because you've got lots of wonderful light outside, you can use a faster shutter speed. The shutter then is going to open like that, but because it's nice and bright, lots of light comes in to the film or the CCD, so it looks nice and bright and sharp. Fantastic. Good answer. So let's talk about film ISO or ASA. Now, ISO means the International Standards Organization. The ISO and the ASA stand for how fast the film can accept the light for good exposure. All right, so faster ASA film is more sensitive to light. However, it's more grainy. And the grain doesn't matter nearly as much when you're using these megapixel iPhones. But when you're using film, it mattered a lot. Now, you can think of it this way. If I had a pancake and I put it out on the driveway on a sunny day, it wouldn't get mushy that quickly. So it would be a low ASA. But if I put a piece of cheese out on the driveway on a nice sunny day, it would accept the heat faster than the pancake does and it would melt right so that's what we're talking about as film or ccds accept the light faster it's how fast that piece of cheese melts how much light it absorbs in a very short period of time make sense great so if i shot this at night with a flash why is part of the subject too dark aiden the aperture like the f-stop Yes. It's small. That's correct. So now answer these questions. What would happen if I made the flash brighter? It probably wouldn't do that much because it can only accept a certain amount of light anyway if the aperture is small. Hmm. Interesting. Well, here's what would happen if I made the flash brighter. I would wash out the horse oh. and I would get more of the carriage. So you got to balance things there as far as your flash. What if I made my shutter speed slower so I could accept more light? The horse might move in that time. That's exactly right. And I'd end up with a blurry horse or I wouldn't be able to hold the camera very still and I'd get a blurry shot. Now, if I made the aperture larger, I might be able to get more light is concerned, but then I would lose my depth of what? The carriage. The depth of field, correct. So then either the horse would be out of focus or the carriage would be out of focus. So if I can't do any of the above, what would I do? Um, By increasing the ASA or the ISO, look what the difference in the shots happens. Wow. Wow. So I'm not adjusting the shutter speed, so I'm not worried about blurriness. I'm not adjusting the aperture, so I'm not worried about my depth of field. I'm adjusting the film speed, how fast the film will accept light that piece of cheese, and look what I get. So we got the science of exposure. You got the aperture, the shutter, and the film speed, and you've got what's called this exposure triangle. I have a question. Sure, go ahead. So on the packet, it talks about natural light and artificial light. Yes. So how would that affect other <laughs> okay. There's a big difference between natural light and artificial light. And actually, I don't go into that so much. You should know that every light bulb has what's called a different light temperature. And some light bulbs, when you take pictures, you notice that everybody comes out sort of green. And then other temperatures, everybody comes out sort of orange. And then you've got natural light temperature. So the difference there is what the color spectrum is of the photo based upon the color spectrum of the artificial light. You'll be able to find that answer in your book too. I may have given you too complicated an answer. 
Hi, I'm Coach Scott from the Global Troop Resource. I'd like to share with you some information about a nonprofit called the Education Alliance for Amateur Radio. These are the guys that I called to help my troop complete the Radio Merit Badge, and they are awesome. If you have any interest in running the Radio Merit Badge for your troop, and are on the East Coast, preferably the Mid-Atlantic region, they are an excellent resource. They also happen to teach the electronics and electricity merit badges, but the radio merit badge is their specialty. Their goal is to promote science, technology, engineering, and math education within organizations like the Scouts, plus communities like first responders and others who use or advance the use of amateur radio. Calling your attention to this nonprofit is just another way that Global Troop Resource is trying to put a thousand skills into every troop's backpack. You can learn more at www.radiostemalliance.org. Now, back to the show. And this week we're talking about art and we're going to be talking about how you should look at your composition as far as your lighting is concerned, whether that's natural lighting or flash. We'll talk a little bit about the rule of thirds, leading lines, angle of view, and framing. And you should know that there is a big difference between photography and simply taking snapshots. When you're doing photography, you understand either the science and the art, or at least the artistic element of it. When you're simply taking snapshots, you're just sort of clicking any which way and then hoping for the best. So natural light, here's a good example of natural lights. Outside, everything's really lit well, it is crisp, it is clear, and it's very easy to see. And it's gonna look a little bit different than your artificial light. Natural light is often used to soften images. <clears throat> now you can see this one, this woman, has got this bright light behind her, which is gonna be the sun. Always be careful not to look into the sun. But you can see how it's really softened up her face here. If she had wrinkles, you're not able to see those wrinkles at all. And over here on this part of the photo, it's so soft that you can't even see what might be in the background. So natural lighting can be used in a number of different ways. One is to light your subjects so that they're crisp and clear, and another is this way so that it's a much softer kind of look. It's very nice for portrait photography. Now shadows. Shadows are important too when you're talking about natural lighting. <clears throat> and this particular photo right here, frankly, I don't think would be interesting at all without the shadow. Now, who can tell me what it looks like the shadow's doing in this picture? Like it's reaching out to something? Yes, it's reaching out to that car that the boy is reaching out for as well. And it's sort of neat there in that you've got two things reaching towards that car, which make it a much more interesting photo than if there were no natural lighting and no shadow. Very good. All right, so there's all kinds of different indoor lighting. And one form of artificial lighting is your flash. And many times your flashes are built right into the camera like this. Other times they are external flashes which sit over on the edge of the camera. And then even other times the external flash is somewhere else. It could be on a tripod or it could be handheld while you're holding the camera. There are a couple of different things that flash is good for, not just only for lighting what's indoors, but you can use it as outdoor fill light. You will get red eye frequently when uh, you use a flash, and we've got methods to mitigate that. And as you saw on the What's the Matter with this picture last time, we were able to bleach people out with flash because the flash was either too powerful or it was too close to the subject. So puzzle me this. Would you ever want to use flash outside on a bright day? Uh, no. Uh, no, 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 don't make it. No, there's, there's no purpose. Yes. Very necessary. No, okay. you, you have natural, because you have natural light, and natural light is always better because it's evenly spread among the whole area rather than flash, which covers uh, the subject that is first in the 
um, what's it called, in the scene. Okay. Then is there anybody that says you would use flash out on a bright day? Nobody. Okay. So let's look at these two pictures. They're both of the same woman. She's outside on a bright sunny day and she's actually on the beach. And I want you to look around her eyes right here. See how she's got dark circles sort of around her eyes? Yeah. That's because her eyebrows and the shape of a person's head can give people these dark, what are called raccoon eyes. And so even on a sunny day, here's a picture of her where we're shooting with a flash on a bright sunny day. And you'll notice she no longer has dark raccoon eyes. This is what we call fill light. Now, there are times when you'll see movies or pictures of photographers doing their work and they'll be having someone stand next to them and they're holding up this big circular disc that's either white or silver or something of that color. That is used as a reflective pad in order to give them fill light so that they don't have to use a flash. But for most of our purposes, we won't have an assistant who's going to be able to stand next to us holding a uh, reflective board. Uh, so we're, we're going to occasionally use flash when uh, we take our photos. And again, we're going to do this with a little bit of the science. You can always do after the fact post editing and try and brighten things up. But generally speaking, you won't be able to brighten up just the eyes. Uh, or around the eyes unless you happen to be really good at Photoshop. All right, so the answer is yes. There are occasions when you might want to use a flash outside. All right, everybody gets that one wrong, so don't worry about that. Hi, Coach Scott here. If you like this show and are watching on our YouTube channel, our current goal is to get a thousand likes and subscribers. You have control over our destiny. Thanks. And now back to the show. So, what's the matter with this picture? Um, his eyes are red. Right, his it's eyes red. are red. Now, what causes it? Oh, How flash? do you prevent it? What? All right, yeah. it is the flash. Do you know the science behind what causes it? Uh, does it have something to do with the retina? <coughs> the retina, like, reflects the light or the something retinas? like that? You got it, absolutely. The retina reflects the light. Now, when you are in a dark environment, your pupils will be wide. When you're in a bright environment, your pupils will constrict. It's like an aperture. When you shoot with a flash, because your pupils are wide, the flash, the light enters the eye, bounces off the retina, and comes back looking red. And that's because the speed of light happens much, much faster than the retina can shrink. So that's why you get that red eye. Now, what can you do to prevent it? Anybody know? Don't use flash. That's one like, answer. Or like you can take a picture with the light, like with lights already on. That is another one. Um, not directly in their eye. That is correct. You can adjust your angle so you're not shooting directly into their eyes. A couple other things you can do. We edit it out later. Like, edit out <laughs> later. That is absolutely correct. You can use post-production to edit that out. And one of the other things that you can do is you can set your camera on what's called red eye or no red eye. Anybody know what that is? No. Okay, that is when oh. your camera flashes more than once. And normally it's three times. And what will happen is it'll go boof, boof, and then boof with a big flash at the end. Now, the two little flashes at the beginning are to get pupils constrict, and then it takes the final flash while your pupils are constricted so you don't get the red eye. Good answers. All right, so what's the matter with this picture? The flash. Uh, he's, 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 like, he's, he's, he's way he's very too much bright. light on him. <clears throat> That's he's right. So. Bright. How do you prevent it? Um, don't back use up. don't yeah, or, or don't use the flash in this scenario. Okay, back up is one answer. Don't use the flash. Take picture with the light on, not just like a flash. That is correct with the light on. Now let me ask you this: If I were to take this picture, it's inside, it's at a party. This guy's a DJ. There's not a whole lot of light going on. 
what would I do to get enough light to take the picture without a flash? What can I do that has to do with the science of photography? All right, this was a lot like the wagon with the horse. Um, widen the aperture? Well, you can widen the aperture. That is correct. Then you would get just your subject in focus and not the near or the far. They would be out of focus. Good answer. Something else you can do. Bigger f-stop. Bigger f-stop. Well, Yes, you want a larger aperture, which would be a smaller f-stop number. That's correct. The last thing that you might want to do is if you decided to not use flash and you wanted to keep your shutter speed appropriate so that you didn't get blur, but enough that you know you could get enough light in, is you could adjust the ASA on your digital camera. Remember, that's the speed with which the film or the CCD accepts the light, okay? You want it to be able to accept the light very, very quickly in order to get enough light onto either the film or the CCD. Good answers. Awesome, all of you. Uh, or if you um, made the shutter speed longer, it would accept the brighter light. And then the darker light would go in too, so then would it even out? Well, if you if you made your shutter speed longer, you'd probably end up being below one sixty fourth of a second. And anything like one thirtieth of a second you'd need to be on a tripod and your people would need to stand still as well. Otherwise they'd be blurry. And since you got a DJ with a whole bunch of people dancing, you'd end up with a bunch of blurry people. All right, and then I have another question, actually. Go ahead. Um, so have you ever seen those pictures of, like, night skies, but, like, stars are, like, moving across the sky? Yes. Those mm -hmm. are awesome, aren't they? Isn't that, like, you keep it, don't you, like, keep the shutter open, like, the whole night so you don't get tracked it across? That is correct. Now, what you'd have to do is set that on a tripod, point it up towards the sky. You'd probably want a very small aperture because you want things uh, near and far in focus. Let's say you wanted, a, I don't know, a desert flower in focus and the sky in focus. And then you'd use the shutter speed of bulb. Remember where I was talking about where you hold a bulb yeah. and you go on, you know, with a blood pressure cuff and you go psh, 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 psh. Same thing. Yeah. They have those for your cameras and you just go and you'd hold it and hold it and hold it. Now, if you wanted a picture for a much longer time, you can actually get digital devices that you can attach to your big SLR cameras that will hold the shutter open for as long as you want to set the timer for. So you could set your timer for three hours and on a tripod and walk away and it would take one picture over a three hour period of the night sky. And that's when you get these really cool things where the stars sort of zoom around the northernmost part in the sky. Very awesome. Does that make sense, Dylan? Yeah. Great. The art of photography is really all about taking the viewer's eye on a journey through your photograph. Okay, and people that like photos will generally see that their their eye does go on a journey through the photograph. You'll have part of the photo and then it'll lead you into another part of the photo. That's a little bit different than portrait photography because portrait photography is all about a person and their personal image. But the photography that's not portrait photography usually takes you on a journey. And there are a couple of things we'll want to talk about. One is called the rule of thirds. The other is called leading lines, and then there's angle of view. And these three things will help take your viewer on a journey through your photograph. Oop, wrong way. All right, so now this is personal preference. There is no right answer, but which boat looks like it's parked and which looks like it might move towards you? Uh, I think the one on the, the right looks like it's moving because it's like coming into the frame. Very good. Who else has got an answer? How about Ethan? I agree with Matt. Okay. It's like 
the right one, it's like in the top left corner of the photo, and the on the left, it's like center, so it just looked like it stopped. Awesome. I think they just zoomed in because it's way bigger in the one picture. Hmm, I bet if I overlap those pictures, they would you'd find that they're both the same size. It's a little bit of an optical illusion that the one's bigger than the other. So those of you who said that the one on the right looked like it would be moving and the one on the left is parked, you are basically believers then in the rule of thirds. And in the rule of thirds, what you do is you divide your photo up into a tic-tac-toe board. And many people believe that images, the primary image in a photo that falls either along the lines, either horizontally or vertically, and especially if the primary subject falls on the intersection of these lines, that the picture is better than if it doesn't. I mean, the proponents will, will claim that aligning the subject creates more tension, it creates more energy, it creates more interest in the particular photograph. And you can see that here, it's more interesting to have a boat that's moving than a boat that's just parked. So that is what the rule of thirds are about. Now I'm going to tell you, in my personal opinion, is it's not a rule. It's a guideline. I will often take photographs and either when I, when I print them or when I'm editing them, I'll find that it looks a little better on certain photographs to not fall on one of those lines, to be more centered. And that's okay, because this is art, and art is all a matter of personal preference. Now, before we said, what's the matter with this picture when the devil baby had red eyes? Now I'm going to ask you, what's the matter with discomposition? Robert. Um, I'm trying to think. What did we just talk about? I'm like into, it's into like a tic tac board of squares. I That's right. And what is this photo not? It's more, well, out of the center. It's more into like more of like the, the face, more into like more different boxes, more. That is absolutely correct. This image is mostly, <laughs> dare I say it, in your face. Um, it's very, very centered, and so you don't really see a whole lot of motion or tension or anything of that nature. Now, this is great portrait photography, but it's not necessarily a photography of interest to anybody beyond parents and grandparents. Good answer. Hi, Coach Scott here. If you like this show and are watching on our YouTube channel, our current goal is to get a thousand likes and subscribers. You have control over our destiny. Well, we're at our 30 minute mark. So let me thank you for watching session two of the Photography Merit Badge. I'll see you next time for part three. The Global Troop Resource, trying to put a thousand skills into every troop's backpack.